Shall we start a session? So, um, our, next, uh, our next panel is convergence. Uh, is graduated regulation still appropriate? And, and we have a, in our panel, we have, um, let me start with Siada, one sec. Digital always makes things interesting. Um, Siada Ramli is the um, Director General of ADIMA, the uh, European Association representing online platforms. She has extensive experience in European public affairs and in particular experience in the European digital sectors. Um, she, she worked for the, uh, she was Secretary General of the European Software Association uh, as well as uh, Senior EU Affairs Manager at Digital Europe. Uh, she has furthermore work, worked for the content sector and the healthcare sectors, and she holds an MA in International Stud Studies and Diplomacy from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, and a BA in Political Science uh, from the American University in Cairo. Um, Tom Mesites, he, he's uh, been working for La Telecom, the leading uh, ICT com company in Latvia, for the last 16 years. He's responsible for the legal and regulatory functions of La Telecom since 2011. Um, it is the largest pay TV services provider in the Baltic countries, fixed broadband services in Latvia, offering wide integrated ICT services to private and corporate customers. Um, but I'm sure that he will, will go into details on, on, uh, of the, the, uh, all the work that, that's been done by La Telecom. And last but not least, we have Tobias Schmidt. Um, he has been head of the media policy at Mediengruppe RTL Deutschland since January 2005, and executive vice president of government affairs at uh, RTL Group since September 2010. Um, from 2005 until 2012, he was uh, appointed chairman of the television department and vice president of the German Association of Commercial Broadcasters and Audiovisual services, Val PRT, uh, on, on who, whose behalf he's speaking today. Um, he became chairman of the board of Val PRT in November 2012. Um, so let, let, me, let me give a bit of, of, of background. Why do we have graduated regulation in, uh, in of audiovisual media services? Um, when at the last revision of the then Television Without Frontiers Directive, um, there were grave concerns by, by many that uh, the EU would start regulating the internet. Um, this, this was not our intention. Uh, the intention was to, to afford um, a reasonable level of protection um, while allowing the new services, on-demand services, to, to grow, to develop. Um, in the whole process, a number of criteria uh, were discussed on, the, uh, on how uh, graduated regulation could work. And, and one of the most important ones was the level of control that someone has when they access on-demand services compared to uh, linear services, broadcasting services, which uh, where uh, the viewer is actually has, has less, on, less control. They can switch on the TV, they can uh, change the channel, but the content comes uh, comes in, in an order that's not decided by the viewer. Um, another issue that, that, uh, that was important for, 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 for deciding on why broadcasting would still be uh, subject to, to heavier regulation than on-demand <laughs> services. Um, this is, has to do with the, the importance of, of TV at the time for the formation of public opinion in German Meinungsbildungsrelevanz. This is something that, that I'm sure we'll, we'll hear, hear again today. Um, so th th this is the why. How, how, how did this materialize in, uh, in the, the Audiovisual Media Service Directive and, and how did the European legislator decide on this? So we have three tiers of regulation. We have one basic tier of regulation for all media services. Um, things like identification, qualitative advertising rules, 
rules on accessibility, um, these cover all audiovisual media services that are covered by the directive. For linear services, broadcasting services, we have the traditional regulation that was already in place, uh, which means that there are quantitative ad advertising rules, uh, minutage for uh, a 12-minute limit of, per hour of, of, of advertising, insertion rules, um, rules on, on major events uh, imp of importance to society, um, short extracts. So a number of, of rules that, for the role that, that, that TV has played until now, uh, are more strenuous than, than the rules that are there for, uh, specifically for nonlinear services. The specific rules, the third level, the third tier of regulation, are the rules on protection of minors and on uh, the promotion of European works. So th these things are covered in both, but for instance, the protection of minors on, uh, on TV, um, their uh, content, uh, programs that uh, might seriously impair minors would be banned while uh, they would be okay for on-demand services with the idea that uh, minors should not normally hear or see that content. Um, this, um, yeah, this, 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 is, this is sometimes under pressure. I'll, I'll come back to that later. Um, we're talking today specifically um, when, when looking at whether gradu graduated regulation is still appropriate at, at, four, uh, at three topics. So uh, promotion of European works, the advertising rules, and protection of minors. Um, if, if there are questions from the floor on other topics, that, that those are, are, are very welcome indeed. Um, also, a, a bit of the, the, the time frame now, uh, back then and now, the, 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 what was the, the situation in the market like? Um, what was it like? Uh, at a time, um, people were actually saying linear TV is dead. In a few years, everything will be on demand. There is no, um, so for that reason, uh, we thought at the time, the European legislator thought, I should say, uh, you have an automatic deregulation. If the market moves from linear services to, to, to non-linear services, on-demand services, the, uh, the, they will go automatically to a lighter touch regime. Therefore, uh, there's no, 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 hopefully, any need to change the directive very soon. Um, of course, the, the, the future is always different than, than you expect it to be. And uh, what do we see today? Linear is strong. Um, on-demand viewing is, 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 is on the rise. Uh, we, we also see viewing habits changing, especially on, amongst younger generations. And uh, this, this, this pushed the Commission to, 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 um, to adopt a green paper and have a consultation on, on these issues specifically. Um, in, in that discussion, um, and where we, we asked for um, for instance, evidence on, on market distortions that would be uh, that that would result as as uh, uh, of the uh, would be a result of the distinction between linear and non-linear services. We got very strong views. Uh, I, I, I think that there were yeah a number of years I, I really couldn't hear the word level playing field anymore because it was uh, yeah in every second sentence it was there. That that has 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 changed a bit the debate there. Uh, but nonetheless, the, uh, the, the media market is changing um, and, and we see signs of, 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 of this change, but we do not know exactly yet where it's going. So the challenge in, in looking back at, at the existing directive and uh, coming with a new proposal in, in 2016 is, is, uh, yeah, is, 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 is high, is difficult and uh, the discussion that we will have today will, will, will certainly help in, in, in uh, defining the, the lines of thought that are out there. Let me go back to the, to the results of the Green Paper. So all, all the results of the Green Paper, they have been published and, and, and most of you have, have I, I think, are familiar with it. Um, so on the three topics that we have here today, on the protection of minors, um, 
I think there's a general consensus that more needs to be done, that the, the level of protection afforded to, to minors uh, as to on the audiovisual media services or even beyond um, audiovisual media services as such, but wider audiovisual content or, or content, there are concerns that, that, that minors should be protected more. Um, what we see in, in the Green Paper, in the results of the Green Paper though, is that there's no consensus on in which direction this should happen. So whether uh, this should be by means of age verification or providing more information, that the opinions are, are very, very, uh, go in different directions. So divergence instead of con convergence on that. As to advertising, there's a strong call for um, having more flexible advertising rules uh, for, for linear services. So either to do away with, with the quantitative advertising rules or to make them more flexible, to adapt them in a way that, that, uh, that it's easier to compete. We see uh, more and more offers, more fragmentation of, uh, of the, the, the viewership uh, eyeballs go anywhere, they go to iPads, they go to TV screens. It's more difficult to, to, to recoup on, on investment made in, in production of, of European works, for instance. Then, then going to the, the, the last topic, um, uh, promotion of European works. That, um, there the, the results of the Green Paper are also going in a different direction. So many deem that the, the, the existing toolbox that is there is not sufficient, it's not working well. Others complain about the, the implementation in the member states being very diverse and, and uh, it's difficult to, to, to deal with those, those things. So um, this is the frame of, of the debate um, as I see it and, and I'm sure that the, uh, the presentations uh, will, will lead to many questions which uh, will bring us further. I, I give the floor to Tobias Schmidt. Yeah, thank you. Um, you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, first of all, of course, a warm thank you from our side to the organization of this, I think, very inspiring conference. Um, I think the topics we have already discussed uh, spotlight on a quite good way uh, the relevant points we have got to handle the next months and years. As Marcel already said, I'm uh, in charge of um, RTL, that's the leading European broadcasting uh, company, and at the same time I'm also chairman of the VPRT, the German Broadcasting Association, with about 140 members. And as you can imagine, that leads to the interesting um, point that um, I have more than one view Unfortunately, also more than one opinion I've got to talk for. <laughs> That's normal if you're working for associations, I think. So, what do we have? First, I think the headline um, is, uh, of this panel is um, interesting by itself. Convergency and graduated regulation. You know, uh, I like it to start with this kind of paradoxon. Um, so, um, what means convergency? Convergency means that we have discussed about convergency since about 20 years and now it really happens. That's an interesting experience for our business. And that of course changes a lot of things. And I've got to point that out because it's not that obvious as far as I can see that convergency means really convergency. I'll give you an example. Some months ago I had, uh, had a conversation with uh, some politicians and they uh, started the conversation with the sentence, oh, we are so sorry, but your business is dead or dying. I said, ah, really, why? I said, yeah, no one is anymore using his TV. First, of course, that's not the complete truth because as you know, approximately 211 minutes a day, interesting experience, is TV consume. Um, but beside this, a um, very important point, broadcasting industry is producing audiovisual content and not devices. So we are not building TV devices, so that's why it's important to know that convergency means that uh, we've got, of course, changed our way to transport our content to the consumers. So and that leads us um, to our challenges and, of course, also to the question, what is the legal framework about? 
and that's again leads to the core point is graduated regulation still appropriate <clears throat> and I would like to point out as a <clears throat> representative of the commercial broadcasting I'm only talking if graduated regulation is appropriate not, not if the regulation is appropriate I think this is also a step in the right direction in the last 20 years um, so but let me come back to the question I think first of all <clears throat> we've got to see that regulation of course is not only because of regulation or to say it in another way it, uh, it's not end in itself regulation is also not primarily designed to make our business more difficult in contrarias as we all know regulation is to try to balance different interests so especially on the one hand the need of free speech and press the possibility of media industry to grow and on the other side the protection of other goods that are as important as the free speech so uh, as I am a German I try to uh, make it a bit structured <laughs> so and uh, that's why I think it makes sense to make a step back when we are talking about regulation to ask okay what are the objectives of regulation and I try to build this three categories <clears throat> I think the first one is very obvious. Um, as I talked about um, protection of minors, but it is also, of course, human dignity and uh, maybe also the media pluralism. We've had the discussion before. All these are goods, I think, where we have a very strong consensus, consensus that this is some, something that is absolute. We don't have to discuss about, and this is to protect. Secondly, we have an area of regulation that is more related to uh, to content that is socio-political desired, meaning content where society has a strong feeling that they would like or we would like to have it. For example, uh, the European productions, but also um, news, regional broadcasting, broadcasting for handicapped people, and so on. And we have the third category, of course, from the point of view of a commercial broadcaster, and this is um, regulation that limits the possibilities of refinancing as we have the quantitative advertisement rules, the qualitative advertisement rules, and of course a lot of advertisement bans. So of course these categories um, may seem to be a bit artificial, but at the end um, for me it's important to make clear that they are related to different objectives and that's why I think it should well, it could make sense to take also a different view on it and graduate it, look on it. So that sounds, as I would say, the question is to answer with yes, there is a need of um, graduated regulation. But, and as you know, there's always a but, but does this um, system that we have really fits the reality? So we have a graduated regulation and it looks more or less like this also very simple I'm coming from the commercial broadcasting so it's not sophisticated um, so we have um, a system of graduated regulation that is related to the technique to the way you consume media so we have the linear TV the broadcasting regulation and we have different other medias and uh, then if we go through this three categories I designed we've got to see that there is difference and that this kind of regulation of course um, is also different to the objectives so theoretically um, for all media I think the group of absolute protective goods is protected here I think we don't have an issue of legal framework here we normally in our experience we have more an issue of execution because as we all know uh, the regulators are not that used to regulate also the online area the second category is much more complicated there we are talking about this um, socio-political desired content as for example European productions and there we've got to see that this is a regulation on the European level but also on the national le level that is only related to the linear broadcasting system and um, of course that leads us to the question why um, and the third, of course, is limitation of refinancing, meaning the advertisement rules. Also here we have got a different approach um, related to the media genres. So we have a very strong regulation for the linear broadcasting and then we have a graduated 
um, regulation for other media business. So, to make one thing clear and also in respect to, um, to what Marcel said, um, the ABMS directive is a directive that was when, she was, when it was implemented uh, way before the time, the, the, the try to, to realize that there is more than only linear broadcasting is obvious in this directive and the, the directive and tries to say yes, we've got to, to find a legal framework also for other medias and out of that there came this kind of graduated regulation. But it is still related to the way you consume and that of course is not the reality we are now confronted with. We all consume content, media content on different devices, linear, non-linear, on demand, uh, on every way and we are in a very strong competitive situation as broadcasting industry with other industries, especially from overseas. Uh, they, they, from overseas, they are um, acting also not only on the linear world or even are not related to it. So, um, that sounds now a little bit like I would like to say there is no need for a graduated regulation. But to be honest, I think that's also not the truth. I think we um, should go, should again take a step away and ask, um, could we try to adjust the principles of um, graduated regulation to the actual situation that we have in reality? And I think that leads us to the following. I think first of all, it makes sense to, um, to ask ourselves if it is, um, if the regulatory objectives that we have, for example, in the ABMS directive, are still valid. And if we answer this with a an yes, then I think we've got to take a look on it, how to make it common and fair as an adjustment of the regulation we have. So that means, for example, if you take the first category, the, um, as I call it, absolute protective goods, I think there we've got to find an, an, to use the word, level playing field, a level playing field of a regulation. But I think the level playing field, of course, is not that interesting. Of course, for us, for us it's important. The question is which level we mean. And I think on this first category, we are talking about very um, valid goods, and that's why we've got to, to realize that we have to have a high level regulation as, for example, we have still in the broadcasting. The other extreme is the objective three, the refinancing or advertisement. I think here we've got to realize that the advertisement rules uh, don't fit anymore the reality. We have, as you said, a very strong um, relation to the logic of hour and minutes and, of course, in a convergent world, this, this idea of consuming content uh, via the clock doesn't work anymore. So, of course, for an on-demand service, this logic of 12 minutes an hour or 20% an hour doesn't make any sense. And uh, that leads us to the very difficult situation that we as the broadcasting industry have got to compete with industries that are not anymore related to that. And coming back to the question, if there is still a need, I think we can ma make a clear question mark behind the questions of this kind of regulation. So the category objective two is the most complicated if we think how to handle regulation in future because here we have two contra contrarious objectives. On the one hand, we would like to have a competitive media, pan-European media business industry and on the other side, a society would like to have special kinds of content and this special kind of content, like news, like European productions, like local productions, and so on, mostly uh, don't fit the economical need. So that leads to the, to the very difficult situation, how to solve this, especially in a an, in an, um, time period where the idea of making restrictive regulation on this topic uh, doesn't work anymore because obviously you know, um, at the moment you also can change your media genre and then you are out of all the obligations but this, is, uh, this can't be the, the idea of the regulation. So I think here it could make sense to think about how we can synchronize the interests of industry and society. So to ask is there a possibility to bring content industry in a situation where it's interesting to do content like 
I said here in this objective tool category. And that is a very interesting point, I think, because it leads us again back to the discussion we had yesterday about access and findability. Because if you're searching for something that could incentivize an, an industry to invest money into content that is from an economical point of view not that interesting, and then you, that leads to the question, what could be in the interest of a broadcaster or another audiovisual media company? And what is there, what, what society could, could give or how could uh, society incentivate? And at the end, I think the answer is very simple. The most worth thing that society has is the support of regulation for access and findability. If there would be a relation between the question how to find a program and the question what the program has on content, then of course it could be very interesting also for companies to say, yes, that's something that's also from a financial point of view interesting. To make it, to make it a bit more concrete, or as Lorena said, I try to make an example, and I think we have this idea of regulation in the old world in one case, and this is the Ofcom model. So if you, if you take a look on the UK regulation, as far as I understand, there we have the so-called public service broadcasting system that says if a company like ITV, Channel 4, Channel 5 is willing to produce <laughs> or to fulfill special public value content, then on the, other, on the other hand, they get from Ofcom, from the regulator, privileged access, frequencies, and EPG positioning. And the most interesting point of this is the system is mainly voluntarily. And nevertheless, ITV Channel 4 and Channel 5 are still in. So obviously this connection between or this connects between um, public value content on the one hand and the question how to find program on the other seems to be strong enough to keep some companies they are interested in in this system. So to make a long story short, at the end, yes, I think uh, there is, um, I think that graduated regulation is also appropriate in the future, but therefore we've got to flip the regulation away from the more technical driven uh, idea of graduation um, up to an idea of objective driven uh, regulation. And uh, I think this also opens the possibility to find a solution in this, in this uh, dilemma between needs of protection, for example, for minors, and the obvious need of industry to get a bit more liberalization on the finance side. So, thanks a lot for your attention. Yes, thank you, Tobias. Um, I, 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 I will comment later. There's only one comment that I have to make now because I, I, I can't let it pass. Uh, that's the, the, the idea that the one objective of regulation is the limitation of refinancing. Um, I'm, I'm sure that, that this could be a result of, uh, of, of, of an objective that there would be limits on refinancing, but the, the overarching principle there is to, uh, to protect consumers um, against excessive advertising and, 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 and other matters. But, so so that, that's the only comment for now. Um, uh, Tom, uh, would you like to, to take the, the floor, please? Yes, hello ladies and gentlemen, uh, thanks for the organizers for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm representing the business organization, uh, I'm not the policy maker, neither the NGO representative or the, um, uh, the sort of uh, wider range opinion maker, but um, I see my role here as, here as, to, uh, as the opportunity to give the insight from the business perspective. I represent a company which is operating uh, in Latvian market only in terms of the uh, pay TV services, uh, which means that it is uh, on a European scale, uh, uh, notably small operation, but still uh, we have uh, gained some, I think, some experience and some knowledge into uh, how this business runs. And uh, 
I will probably touch upon uh, some of the aspects, some, uh, some of the conclusions we have uh, come across. Yes. Uh, this is how we see the uh, sort of some of the most important uh, tendencies in the Latvian market as it concerns the uh, pay TV business and uh, more uh, sort of specifically uh, uh, on demand services versus linear services. We have over 75% uh, internet penetration in the country. Uh, which is not the uh, highest level of penetration, but still uh, notably high, which means that most of the population have the access to quite the range of the content services. And we have one of the uh, highest rates uh, in Europe and even in the world of uh, really high-speed internet uh, broadband services above uh, 50 uh, megabits per second or even above 100 megabits per second. We have a very uh, strong dominance of the pay TV services. Uh, free to air uh, currently, currently represents probably less than something like eight or seven percent uh, of all of the uh, users of TV uh, at all. Uh, platform wise, we see that uh, IPTV services are growing and OTT as well. Uh, DVB-T uh, and uh, satellite uh, access services are more or less flat, not decreasing, but uh, still not increasing as well. Uh, we see quite a drop in the, uh, uh, for the analog uh, cable uh, services as the sort of outdated uh, technology, but still they have a pretty um, notable role in the marketplace. We see on-demand services increasing uh, uh, quite uh, notably, but we also see that uh, linear is still powerful, and uh, I will probably touch on that uh, a bit later, but we don't see that uh, increasing of the on-demand services is uh, killing linear. Uh, quite to the contrary, in some aspects, uh, on-demand services are even helping uh, linear services to survive and even evolve. Uh, we are operating uh, in a very open market and very open society, and we are uh, more and more facing the global competition from the global players uh, and uh, global content providers. Uh, just to mention that we are expecting uh, HBO pretty soon come into the market and uh, probably some other global OTT players as well. We see some moves from uh, Russia-based OTT services already present in the market and uh, that sort of um, uh, pushes us think of the, um, of the challenges which are ahead of us. Uh, we see quite a substantial risks if we talk about the uh, audiovisual services in general, uh, specifically geopolitical risks and uh, opening spe uh, speakers uh, very extensively uh, touched upon these issues. Uh, what we see as the problem is quite a weak uh, application of regulation. We see that the regulation is in place, but due to the lack of the resources uh, for the uh, authorities and regulatory institutions, we see that the regulation is not applied uh, properly to, to all of the market, which is uh, distorting uh, the sort of fair competition in the market. And we see uh, quite an impact still of the uh, piracy and illegally, um, illegally broadcast and illegally uh, uh, shared uh, content on, uh, on the internet in the first place, but we also see that um, uh, there's a quite a lot of uh, pirated or semi-pirated services available on the market on, on different other platforms as satellite, uh, cable TV, and uh, et cetera. Uh, we, have, uh, we also see that the locally produced content uh, uh, which is produced in the country and speaks about the country and about the reality here is still very competitive. Nevertheless, it's uh, facing the global competition and the resources available in the uh, market of the size of the Latvia 
uh, are very limited, but still we see that uh, people prefer uh, locally produced content and uh, very much uh, sort of enjoy it. And uh, it's, it's, um, uh, because of that, it's, it's still very competitive. And we see that the development of the technology uh, brings us uh, quite a huge opportunities ahead. And we see that uh, we uh, can sort of expect very interesting times ahead. Yeah, this is just shortly what La Telecom is. It's a, a Latvia-based telco operator, owned still in a majority by, by the state, but uh, we have the private partner, uh, Telia Sonora, which is major uh, Scandinavian um, uh, telco operator. But um, uh, that state shareholding doesn't mean that we are uh, not sort of operating in competitive env environment. We are very much operating as the privately owned company and facing the same challenges as any other private company. We have uh, many other uh, business lines apart from the broadband access services and pay TV services like uh, business process outsourcing, a network construction and maintenance and so on. Quite a complex or organization for that uh, size of the market. Uh, our journey, uh, well, specifically from 2007 when we entered uh, the pay TV services with our IPTV platform and started to offer triple play services and on-demand services as well to a certain extent. Before that, I mean, in general, this journey is, is uh, quite common for uh, almost any incumbent uh, European telco operator starting as the uh, incumbent voice service provider continuing as the broadband internet access service provider and moving to the service company. And now the next move we see ahead of us is uh, moving into the content and probably advertisement uh, business as well, since we see the certain convergence and uh, synergies between those two businesses. Uh, this is just uh, what kind of, uh, in our opinion, uh, on-demand services are we providing because we don't look at them as much as from the perspective of the definition of the law, but uh, rather than uh, from the perspective of the user. Uh, we see that normally or traditionally uh, the uh, customer is uh, consuming the audiovisual content on the linear base, watching the program when it's aired, but uh, we were the first in the market to introduce uh, those kind of services as catch-up or time shift, which allows you to, uh, uh, to watch the uh, aired, uh, aired program whenever you like during the seven-day period. We call it an archive service. We have the NPVR service, which we call uh, uh, recording, which means that you can activate um, uh, activate the recording function for the certain uh, program you want to, uh, uh, to view uh, later after the air airing of that particular program. Why those are differentiated, uh, that's because of the uh, restraints uh, coming from the copyright. Uh, not all of the channels allow us to, to offer the catch-up. Uh, uh, many more allow us to provide NPVR, but uh, some of the channels uh, allow neither of them. We have quite an extensive uh, library of, of uh, movies and TV shows and, and, uh, and uh, concerts and different other kind of, of uh, video rental uh, stuff. Uh, uh, we have developed that service on our own. Uh, it, it works pretty well, and I mean, to, to, the, to that scale, we are probably still the only ones in the market to be able to offer that. But now, as I, as I mentioned already, OTT, are coming, uh, OTT players are coming in the market, and uh, we will face uh, quite a tough competition soon. And there are uh, many other functionalities for, for those services, like uh, uh, choice of the audio language, choice of the subtitles, and so on. This is how we see TV uh, uh, business in general. We see that uh, the TV is still media number one compared to any other kind of media like printed press or, or um, even uh, 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 online media or even, uh, even the radio. We see that TV set still dominates over uh, PCs and tablets and smartphones and the other devices and consumption of the audiovisual 
uh, content, um, we see that the, as much as it concerns the pay TV business, it's still growing, but um, on demand is uh, growing at much faster rate, definitely. Uh, we see that there are more connected households, uh, increased download speeds, which means that um, there is more content consumption, there's more competition into the content, uh, and uh, uh, more on-demand consumption as well, uh, naturally, as, as the uh, sort of choices uh, vary more. We see that the uh, younger audiences are more connected than uh, globalized generations. We see that they sort of uh, think more globally and more, uh, more, they're more attached to their devices and connectivity as, as the older generations. That uh, goes without saying, of course. We see them more using four screens and many of them simultaneously. I mean, uh, watching the TV and simultaneously chatting on, on the tablet or, or smartphone is, is pretty usual way of, of um, spending free time for kids. We see that um, uh, uh, in this generation, uh, on-demand is prevailing over linear. Definitely, they do not understand why do they have to, uh, to um, adapt their own schedule to the uh, TV programming schedule instead of uh, being able to watch whatever they, they please at, uh, uh, and whenever they, they please to do so. We see also some tendencies into uh, uh, an aspect of the telco and media convergence. We see that um, um, uh, we see many sort of tendencies and particular transactions where uh, uh, telco, traditional telco companies are uh, acquiring content or acquiring uh, content production companies and vice versa. Um, uh, content acquiring distribution platforms and, and uh, uh, those two, uh, the borderline between those two industries is becoming uh, less visible, we would say so. We see that uh, something like five years ago, uh, the uh, distribution platforms, which we uh, represent uh, uh, to the extent, had the market power. Uh, probably you may not agree to that, but we still believe that we had some market power. We were those who could influence uh, what content is delivered to the audience and in what manner it is delivered. Now we see that uh, this market power is uh, gradually shifting because uh, the vari variety of the uh, distribution platforms becomes um, more wider uh, and the content owners have many choices how to reach the audience. They don't necessarily need any particular distribution platform. In some cases, they can directly access the, um, the um, um, uh, equipment actually where, where the uh, audiovisual content is consumed. Thus, the market power shifts to the content. Um, I think it is quite obvious that there's a saying that content is the king and content was probably always a king. What we believe is that today uh, the content becomes, uh, as we say, King Kong. So we, uh, we believe that uh, the uh, role of the content production and the content itself becomes uh, even more important as it was uh, ever before. So the, the, the sort of uh, platform operators should adapt to the new rea reality and think of the uh, um, of the ways how to change the business models uh, to, to maintain the competitiveness. About on-demand and uh, linear services, uh, we see, as I mentioned, that on-demand is increasing, but then we can question whether really the linear is decreasing. Uh, we wouldn't necessarily uh, subscribe to that point of view because we, uh, what we see clearly is that uh, if we speak about the um, services like, um, um, like uh, catch-up services or, or MPVR services, we see that those channels to which those um, catch-up or MPVR services are available to, uh, they increase uh, the loyalty uh, of the customers to those channels uh, largely thanks to those additional services. 
I mean, if the customer is able uh, to watch the, the program after the airing time and, and uh, rewind it back and start from the beginning and uh, do that uh, sort of, of uh, activity, they become more attracted to that particular channel and they consume it more because normally the uh, content owners are very concerned that uh, those uh, additional services do not allow them to fully uh, sort of execute on, on putting the advertisement because the customer can sort of uh, skip it and, and so on. But uh, we, we don't see that that's uh, very much true. We see that those channels having those uh, functionalities are more successful. Speaking about on-demand, uh, we see, as I mentioned, that the competition is global. Uh, the regulation is well, uh, in many ways global, uh, in uh, many ways EU uh, uh, level, and in many aspects uh, very localized. There is some controversy in this. Uh, we see that we uh, more and more have to operate in the global environment and in global competition under the rules very specific to the local markets or, or uh, EU level and uh, compete with the, not necessarily the service providers, but the services as such available on the global scale and are uh, not being directly bound by, by the regulations of, of the sort of local legislation or EU legislation. We see, as I mentioned, the application uh, uh, being problematic on the local level. Uh, mainly because the environment is changing and the uh, regulation always uh, seems to catch up and to try to frame what's present in the market and how the market operates at the current uh, moment. But the market is evolving, it's developing, new services are coming in, the business models are changing and um, legislative framework is really facing the difficulty to catch up and to live up to the, the reality. Uh, we see in particular in our market that there's a lack, lack of resources for, uh, for the regulatory authorities uh, to really adapt um, and to sort of um, apply the regulation which is available to them. And we see it as the problem. We have discussed this matter on, on many levels for many years now. We see piracy really as a major factor, uh, at least in, in our market. Uh, uh, and it's... Uh, this problem uh, has been addressed lately for, for a couple of years now, and we are very grateful to the, um, uh, to the uh, policy makers and authorities that uh, attention has finally been brought to that problem and, and uh, it's been addressed at least. Uh, in terms of what we do uh, to promote European works, we, uh, to a certain extent, promote, uh, produce our own content. As I mentioned, we are moving into content production ourselves uh, on a very little scale by now, but uh, we'll probably increase the presence there. I'll uh, show you some examples later. We very much and consequently support locally produced con content. Uh, some smaller channels, some startups, some uh, event-based uh, broadcasts. Uh, and uh, we see it, um, we, we don't do it uh, only as the um, sort of uh, way of uh, proving our uh, social responsibility, but also we see that th this is really demanded and it goes well with the local a audience. And we, uh, we provide the user-friendly uh, service uh, uh, providing easy ways to find and to, uh, to find specifically uh, European works in our lab library, for example, and, and to, uh, to access it easily. Protection of minors according to the current requirements is, is secured. Uh, we uh, provide the access codes for any content which, is, uh, which falls under those definitions and, and it works pretty well. We haven't received many complaints from our customers. Uh, in this respect. And we also try to contribute to, uh, for improved uh, regulation as much as we can. We are in the constant discussion with the policy makers and with the authorities, uh, sort of providing the feedback from the market and our ideas how, how the regulation and application of the regulation also could be improved. 
Uh, this is just uh, uh, to highlight some of the examples of the uh, content which we have produced ourselves. Uh, we are working now on so-called pop-up channels. Those are event-based uh, TV channels being aired, uh, uh, well, in between one and three months period. Uh, this is, we, we started actually in 2013 with um, Song and Dance Festival channel, which is quite a major event, Song and Dance Festival in, in our country was uh, quite a uh, notable and, and, and high uh, cultural importance in the society and we reflected uh, both all, the, all of the concerts and, and events around that, uh, that festival for uh, a little bit more than a month. It was very well received, surprisingly, even uh, we had quite a large audiences for that channel, even though it was uh, aired in the summertime in June and July. Then uh, in uh, the summer 2014, we aired Positivist TV channel, which is major uh, rock festival in, in, in the Baltics. And now we did, uh, in December 2014, uh, culture, culture channel uh, 360, uh, which was very much devoted to Riga being the European capital of culture in 2014. And we're continuing with that concept now airing uh, Satori TV, which is reflecting very much of the intellectual interviews and, and debates, also very, very well received. All of that content is also available on demand. Uh, this is put into the library and uh, customers can access uh, the content whenever they like. Uh, besides, uh, what I didn't mention is that we are not uh, we are monetizing actually on, on library services. The uh, video on demand is, is not purely pay-per-view based, but it's, um, the payment is for the access for 24 hours. But uh, in terms of the catch-up services and NPVR services, it's included in the basic subscription, so it's not separately charged. And we do not uh, also monetize it in terms of advertisement yet, but we are thinking about it actually, and it's next thing to come. What do we expect from the uh, uh, regulation perspective? We expect, of course, business to be consulted with. I think that's what all businesses wish for, uh, that uh, the business is listened to and uh, the information is gathered more or less directly from the uh, business or from the NGOs representing the business organizations. We expect that uh, before putting heavy regulation, uh, the existing regulation is applied properly. We also expect more proactive or less reactive approach of the regulation. I think that's the most difficult part uh, for the regulation to be able to frame the reality which will come, not the reality which is uh, already behind. Uh, and I think that's the most difficult part in terms of uh, you know, a difficulty to, uh, to envisage and to forecast uh, what would be the new services, the new business models, and how that environment would operate. We think that uh, globalization should be always kept in mind. We, we are not living in isolated uh, European world and, and uh, even less in, in, um, in country-based markets, uh, we're uh, living in globalized mark, uh, globalized marketplace, and that has the very much the significant impact on the regulation uh, approach as well. Specifically, in Latvian market, we expect that uh, uh, virus, piracy is addressed uh, properly and and uh, uh, to provide the opportunity uh, for the market players, which are. Um, uh, playing fairly uh, to, to have the fair competition and, and uh, sort of uh, equal rules. We expect also the regulation uh, to be equal to all technological platforms, te technology neutral, uh, uh, to capture uh, all, of the, uh, all of the platforms where the uh, content is distributed. And we all also expect the regulation to be effective, uh, generally and equally applied to all of the market and uh, enforcement uh, to be very, uh, really effective uh, to provide that uh, uh, the discipline is, is, is in place and everybody uh, in the market understands that the regulation should be uh, complied with. So this is it from my side. Uh, the slogan of our company is everything is possible. This is in Latvia. Thank you.
Thank you, Tom. Um, I, I now pass the floor to, to Seattle Ramley on behalf of Adima. Thank you. Hello, I'd first like to thank the Presidency for inviting me to speak here today. Um, so, as Marcel had mentioned, I represent the online, or Adima represents the online platforms um, active in Europe, be it the European platforms or the global players as well. Um, going straight into the subject matter, because we don't have a lot of time left, um, we see that the digital technology today reduces produ uh, production and uh, distribution uh, costs for content, which is of particular interest to European content providers and producers. It allows producers to reach a global audience. Again, this is something that has time and time again been uh, of European concern due to access to European content, um, how to get the scalability on the market. We see that the online platforms and um, online um, media actually allows for global access to content that otherwise might not have gotten global recognition. Um, consumer viewing patterns still show that linear broadcasting continues to be strong. There's a strong uh, consumer interest for linear broadcasting, so we don't see that there is any form of market distortion caused by the differentiation between the linear and non-linear um, services. Uh, producers can also provide non-linear um, services and we see, um, as our, the previous two speakers have spoken, that more and more um, traditional media also uh, seek to use non-linear um, services going forward. With regards to the, uh, the audiovisual media services directive, um, we, we find that it has provided with a framework for traditional broadcasters to uh, diversify and innov innovate in terms of their service offerings and also to allow for uh, new online players to come on the market, which only acts as um, a, a benefit to the con end consumer because you've got better productions coming online, you've got more choice, and you're, you're, you've got more access to various products on the market. Um, one key element is uh, we believe that online service offerings obviously allow for more empowerment of the consumer. It, it means more empowerment in terms of user controls, um, which brings us to the issue of, for example, parental control when it comes to some of the uh, content that might not be appro appropriate to minors. There we also think that because of that online control, um, it justifies that the, media, or the AVMS directive um, ha is less stringent with regards to some of its regulation in certain areas for the online players because we, we have that more, um, the, the ability to control things more online. What do I want to go to next? I, I, I kind of reorganized it as I was hearing the speakers go along. Um, one thing I want to point out, however, with regards to the directive is that from our perspective, the discrepancies in the application of the country of origin principle um, creates bottlenecks and legal uncertainty going forward. So that is an area that we would like to see uh, more uh, in, in practice, more applicability of the directive in terms of making sure that the country of or origin principle is pulled through is respected and the, the principle is, is taken forward. With regards to the graduated approach um, of the directive, we, we see that it is appropriate not only today but in the foreseeable future. We believe that not linear and non-linear services are complementary. Um, they don't benefit the same popularity or audience, uh, uh, of the same popularity or audience uh, with regards to um, the access to the services they provide. And that's why we think that um, at the same time, they, they don't necessarily entail the same consumer expectations. And so the graduated approach is the right way to move forward. Um, online service providers are investing heavily, be that uh, European online service providers or the, the global ones 
in terms of um, including content in original languages, uh, meeting consumer expectations on what they would like to watch, when they would like to watch it. And so we're committed to content creation. Um, we also act as an, a window to the world. That's how we would like to see each other, uh, ourselves in terms of European content providers. We allow that access to a global audience um, and would like to continue to do that which would then lead to a truly competitive and innovative marketplace, which obviously benefits the creators, benefits the consumers, and we think it's a win-win for all. A more competition in uh, the non-linear market, as I said, it benefits all uh, parties. And then maybe to close, I would like to say that whereas in a lot of the discussions that we have, especially at European level with regards to regulation, we're often seen as asking for no regulation. That's not the case. We think that the Audiovisual Media Services Directive is an area where we've got a framework in place that seems to be future-proof, that has allowed for enough flexibility to allow innovative solutions to come on board and um, is actually the right way forward. It's striking a good balance. There are definitely areas that we could always say, ideally, there might be improvements needed. However, um, the, the directive as it currently stands has allowed for future solutions to come on board. We're seeing a massive uptake in terms of the, the, the services that are provided online today in Europe. We're also seeing the user-generated content consumers becoming creators of their own. Um, this is something that we need to foster. And so if, if as, as a representative from industry, if I can say, uh, give a few encouraging words here, I think that the um, European Commission, the European institutions as such, have come up with a directive that has provided an adequate framework for an innovative sector to move forward as opposed to some of the prescriptive regulation that we're currently seeing being discussed at different levels within the institutions that would hinder innovation. So um, I think that, that is in a nutshell where I would like to leave it. Thank you, Siana. Um, I'll start, I'll start with questions. I'll start with Tobias. Um, the, um, you mentioned a number of, of, of objectives um, and the, the objectives of regulation. Um, you could qualify, and, and, and these objectives are, are there in, in every uh, member state. Um, what about the, the objective of the internal market? Because, um, for instance, a, a concept like, uh, that you, you refer to, like, like the incentive-based regulation where uh, normally a member state uh, concerning uh, public value content would, um, on the one hand, put obligations on, on a media service provider, a broadcaster, and on the other hand, you would have certain benefits. Um, how, how would that play out um, in the internal market, taking into account subsidiarity, taking into account, w w would there need to be some legislation at European level in that, that respect? Yeah, I think this, um, you're right with this question because, of course, it's um, especially in respect to the subsidiarity, um, it's, it's not that easy to answer. What I try to make is to say, I think, if, if you take these three categories, this or similar like this. I think there are two related clearly to the EU regulation, like advertisement regulation on the one hand, but also protection of goods like protection of minors on the other. The category in between, of course, is something there, right, that's more related to member states. Um, I think, nevertheless, we've got to think about how to, to make a kind of an of an angle or anchor into uh, the ABMS directive because also the, the discussion yesterday showed us that as long as also a European legal framework is asking for, for example, the European content uh, to support European culture and uh, obligates different kinds of media to fulfill, as long we also have got to see the other side of the medal and that means infrastructure access. 
So, and that's why that's that's a system we already have. It's not all in the ABMS directive, but the question should we continue this logic or not, I think needs an answer. To be very honest, if you ask my members at the VPRT, from 140 members, you will find a lot of members, they don't think that it makes sense to prolong this idea of a balance between obligations and privileges. And also from the RTL perspective, to make this also clear, I'm not asking for this, uh, for you know, a new monster of regulation. Uh, I only say as long as society is asking for this kind of content as long we have got to have a balance so it has to be coherent and um, to come back to your question i think if we would like to uh, to to continue with this regulatory approach uh, then it could make sense to make a kind of an angle to say member states should could would however um, support this kind of public value, and maybe we should have a discussion what public value means. I think it's not that complicated. At the end, it's always the same four or five kinds of content, but that could make sense. But to make it clear, if the, the, the social political consens would be that there is no any more need for that, that's for a company also fine. So that's why I'm mainly asking for coherency. A, a second question. Um, where, where do you stand on, on protection of miners? Uh, you, you, clearly, you, you ask for a um, leveling down of the, of the rules on, on, on advertising, on the television advertising rules. What, what about protection of miners? As I said, I think that, um, the, uh, that protection of miners as well as protection of human dignity is something we don't have to discuss about. So this is, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, is important. I think that the level of regulation as we have it in the linear broadcasting world, theoretically and concretely by the regulators in the markets I am, um, works. So and maybe this could be, you know, the kind of blueprint also for other areas. My experience in protection of miners, especially in the German market, is more uh, that the question of how to execute, especially in the non-linear world, because it's not that easy to get an overview um, for the regulators, and there we've got to find uh, to find um, practical ways to handle it. But from a level of regulation, from my point of view, it's um, that's there's no no matter to discuss. But, but does that mean that you would advocate for, for having a, a higher level of protection for on-demand services as, as there are in the near services? Yeah, that's, as, as a representative of industry, it's always a bit difficult to ask for a higher level of uh, regulation, but nevertheless, I would, I would like to answer it in that way. We, as linear broadcasting companies, can live with this level of protection of minors, and I'm quite optimistic that this also would be possible for other industries. Thank you. Yes, of course. Just a quick uh, comment on that. I think that something to bear in mind as well with regards to nonlinear service and pr protection of minors is a lot of the industry-led initiatives that are going on in that, in that perspective as well. Things that have not got to do with regulation as such, but where industry is trying to come up with various ways to uh, protect miners as well, to have more uh, understandable solutions in terms of, um, of filtering, in terms of gate, uh, age gates, in, in terms of how to make sure that it's more difficult for the miners to access the content online. Um, and that n regulation might not be the only way forward. I think that industry has de definitely understands their responsibility in that area and has been trying to come up with various solutions. So I just thought that that might be not noteworthy. Thank you, Sianna. Um, Toms, um, when, when I, um, at, at the end of your presentation, you, you, um, you refer to regulation should be equal for all platforms and, and all players. What, what does that mean in, in respect of our discussion today as, as to the level of regulation for, for um, linear services and non-linear services. Do you think that the, the balance is there or should it be leveling down, leveling up? Yep. Well, uh, the on-demand services work on the sort of full and decent scale for uh, IPTV or, or OTT platforms normally, but due to the availability of the set of boxes for the satellite, for the uh, digital cable, 
There are recording functions for that. Uh, there are uh, different kinds of accessibility to on-demand services outside of IPT, IP uh, platforms, basically. So, and um, we believe that it is sort of perceived that those uh, regulation, regulatory requirements apply normally to IP-based uh, services, not to all of the other platforms where normally on-demand services are not available at all or historically wasn't available. Well, we see that uh, this regulation should be considered to be applied in practical terms to all of the platforms regardless of how the signal is delivered. You're, you're, you're actually saying that the, um, that the directive has, is, is, is applying to services. Um, what, 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 what is not being applied, or what is not being applied in the right way, according to uh, What is not being applied, and what, what is not being applied in the right way, according to you? Uh, well, I mean, uh, we, can, we can quote uh, many of the examples, and this, it doesn't uh, only refer to the uh, on-demand services, but in general to the regulation and regulatory requirements which are applied to the service providers in pay TV. I mean, there are, let's say, must-carry rules which differentiate uh, for different platforms. It's not applied to the satellite. And uh, uh, all of the must-carry uh, channels here in the country are coming with the uh, catch-up and NPVR services, which are not necessarily available on the satellite platform, not to mention uh, the, the additional functionality. And there are many more examples. So I understand you, you refer to, to rules beyond the audiovisual media services directive in this respect. So, uh, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think I think the, the, you answered the second question I had as well. Um, as as to um, competition and Seattle, um, um, uh, you're saying the the the, the on-demand services are complementary to um, to, uh, to to linear services. Uh, Tobias says. Uh, they are actually competing very much with these new services. So competing with complementary services. On the other hand, you have Tom's who says um, on-demand services actually drive linear services. Catch-up TV uh, increases. Uh, possibly uh, all three of you are right uh, or not. Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I think we've got to differentiate because, of course, the usage of audiovisual media content in general is increasing by the combination of linear and nonlinear. Um, uh, the, the, but, of course, from company perspective, the increase of use is fantastic, but at the end we are asking for the interesting question how to refinance and the possibilities of refinancing are not increasing in the same way. And they have got, that's why I think this discussion is so worth to be done because of course to react on this situation means that you are more or less in the same market. The on-demand um, um, companies as well as linear broadcasting as well as every other kind of content people consume. But the possibilities to react on the re refinancing base are not the same. So, as we mentioned already, the question, uh, are, am I allowed to, to, to make advertisement whenever I would like to, like in the most online media you can do, or is there a rule of 20% and an exception rule for the single spot and things like that. And that's why, uh, for sure, the audiovisual media content is increasing and it comes up the best time for this kind of content. But to react on this market for the question of refinancing, we've got to face that others, because of another kind of technical delivering, can earn um, money on a way we can't. And uh, that's why, to make this also clear, to react on this new market situation and the competition situation we have is only our obligation. That's, that, therefore, we are companies. That's something we've got to realize and we've got to handle. But we have to have a look if the legal framework brings us um, 
in, an, in a fair situation to react on that. And I think that that's why we've got to differentiate between the, the consume or the usage of a content and the possibility to get it refinanced. Yeah, and I think I also mentioned with regards to our, the consumers um, and, and our audience as such, the differentiated audience that we have. I think for the first time ever, we've got uh, more content than we've ever been exposed to, I think, in the past. Uh, we're also taking in more content than we have in the past, whereas, uh, and I'm probably showing my age now, I remember when I was young, you used to have to wait until a certain hour to be able to watch your favorite program in the evening. That's no longer the case. People are, um, are inundated with content on different media, on different screens at the same time, and are taking all of that in, um, different kinds of content at the same time. And I think um, where, Marcel, you pointed out, I don't think that any of us is wrong in, in the way we present it. I think um, what Tobias was saying was we're competing for attention, we're competing for funding. Yes, that is the case but we are complementary in terms of our service offerings today. And at the same time, I do think that uh, Tom's point with regards to the non-linear services driving linear services is also correct. So I think that actually all three points very much coexist. It's just that we're seeing different parts of the same, of, 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 the, of, the, of the issue. Well, I think that there, there's no simple answer to that. I mean, that there is a competition, definitely, and there is a, a way to sort of gain from that competition for all the players involved. And I think that the uh, market and actually the way it works is still shaping. I mean, it's not it's not there yet. I mean, it's uh, it's still and it's shaping at a quite of a substantial speed. And probably uh, a year from now, we will see a different picture how it works. Most definitely, we will see. I think. And um, uh, in, in that respect, I think in some aspects, what I wanted to say is that, wanted to stress is that in some aspects, uh, nonlinear services are helping actually, for example, to increase the loyal loyalty for the particular TV channel. That's the way it works. It really, we, we see it from the practice. We see that we have, uh, for a particular channel, we removed the catch-up services in NPVR and the viewership dropped. We just saw it in a month, so and, and vice versa. We renewed those services, and uh, the total viewership increased. So, those are aspects wh where where it helps. Of course, in 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 uh, terms of refinancing, it it uh, causes trouble for the for the channel. But I think that the channel should adapt actually to that situation because that's a reality. The uh, the on demand is is playing um, a more significant role, and the channels will have to adapt uh, one way or another. Thank you. Before I, I open the, uh, the, 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 to the floor, one, one last question to, to, to be us. If, if um, there would be a deregulation de of, of, of quantitative advertising rules, um, what, what is the guarantee, um, if, if, if there would be consensus at European level, what is the guarantee that, that member states wouldn't keep uh, very strong rules or that they um, yeah, that, that you would end up with less harmonization and uh, how important is, is this, this, this freedom in relation to, to keeping the, the, uh, the, the balance between the, the, the levels of regulation between the member states? As far as I understand, these are two questions in one. First, um, especially from the perspective of a pan-European broadcasting company and more or less one level of regulation with minimum standards on, on the European base, I think is essential for growing in the European market. Um, as we also discussed yesterday, that's why, beside all special issues we have, for example, here, the uh, country of origin principle is something uh, that is that is key, that we have to have. If we don't have, then there won't be any European media industry that we've got to realize. Um, on the other side, to, uh, to put more, f uh, more um, flexibility into the advertisement rules, of course, there's no guarantee, like also at the moment, that every member state uh, will implement um, the same possibilities of liberality. We have the rules in the UK are sometimes stronger, we have stronger rules for children, programs, advertisement in Germany, and so on. That's, that's still something we have, but, you know, um, first, of course, 
at the moment there is no possibility also for the member states to get more liberal because they have to fulfill the minimum standards of advertisement rules of ABMS directive and as far as I can see the discussion for example in Germany I have the impression that the will in the markets from regulators and politicians to get on a more liberal base for advertisement and we're here we're only talking about advertisement uh, it's growing and that at the end brings me the the positive perspective that it will happen because if countries or member states are interested in having an, an healthy media industry then they have to support the broadcasting industry because we are the key motor of creative industry in all the states so that's why there is a core interest for society to have a very healthy broadcasting system and if there is a need for the broadcasting industry to react on another market situation we have as you said we've got to we've got to adapt and to act on it then I think it's in the core interest of the member states on their society and economic system to uh, to give the broadcasting industry the possibility to react and that's why at the end I think it will happen because it makes sense thank you Tobias let's let's open questions to the floor so the gentleman there Thank you. Uh, I'm Leo Pekkala from the Finnish National Audiovisual Institute. I'd just like to uh, comment on Mr. Uh, Meistel's uh, uh, speech about the protection of minors um, when you said that you uh, haven't had much of complaints and you think that there are enough preventive mechanisms. I think uh, no preventive mechanisms or technical solutions will solve the pro problem of protection of minors uh, because any solution, technical solution or preventive mechanisms will be overridden or bypassed in no time uh, as soon as they've been de developed and, and launched. Uh, and, and the only, I believe that the only uh, sustainable solution to this problem is really to enhance media education, which means to uh, uh, enrich and enhance the role of, uh, of uh, media literacy skills of children and young people and all of us who work and live with children and young people thank you i i would think that it's not really a question but i i think most of us would agree that media literacy media education is a plays an important role in in uh, in, in society of today other questions Hello, good afternoon. Libor Manda, Seznam Del CZ Company. Uh, Tobias raised the question of social political desired content, and it could somehow sound that uh, we non leader non linear companies are somehow lacking behind, or, or this is not even interesting to us. Uh, so, just I'd like to mention, just br in brief, five uh, you know projects we do have. And this, this is run by the Seznam.cz in the Czech Republic. We have, a, we have special format, uh, format movies for blind people. We have Safer Internet Project that is called Meet in Safe, which is dealing with problematic issues on the internet, such as sexting, e-stalking, sexual, sexual abuse of children. We have also special inter, uh, Safer Internet Project dedicated to seniors, as we've seen not only ch children, but also seniors, as two most sensitive and most endangered groups. Uh, then we are preparing special format maps for wheeled ch uh, people that will uh, allow to present the professionally measured data on accessibility. And last but not least, uh, we have uh, launched a special format maps for blind people where you can then in the end print something like this. It's a touchable, sensible map you can see. So you, you, you can touch if everyone is interested just to touch it, just to see how it looks like. Please come to me and I show it to you. So we are definitely not uh, luck behind. Thank you. Um, only to make this clear, I've absolutely, I mean, that's, um, of course, you are not, and this is. What I wouldn't say that, or I wouldn't blame other industries that you are not um, paying onto this uh, social needs. 
The point I had was only that we, we as industry have obligations. This is something else uh, than doing, so that there is in a lot of companies and a lot of industries an intrinsic motivation to fit social needs, I think is clear. But here, of course, as the panel said, we are talking about the regulatory aspect of that. I think if that's the... Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will... There was... I think it was you, Tobias, who said that co talking about level playing field, or maybe it was you, the moderator, was talking about level playing field is not on the agenda. But I would like to put it on, on the agenda again because what we have created with the AVMS Directive is a framework of the internal market. We have values on promotion of European content. We have values regarding advertising rules, values regarding media pluralism, and protection of minors. So we think in Europe we have created a good marketplace reflecting these values. And we are trying now to adjust these values in order to, to embrace the, the on-demand services and the digital world. But my question is, and maybe it's more directed to you, Tobias, is that if we really want to create a level playing field, look at the borders between the European marketplace and the global marketplace. Are we, can we solve this problem with the newcomers coming in, Google, Apple, uh, and so on, coming into the marketplace and actually um, having a dominant place in the marketplace? Can we solve this problem by just adjusting the AVMS directive, or do we need to broaden the scope of the directive? Is this a question for us in this forum, or is it a question in this framework? I don't know. Thank you. It's certainly a question, the, the scope of, of the directive, uh, whether, whether it, it should be adapted. And um, yeah, I, I don't know where I'll answer first, and, and then, then, then I'll give the floor to you. Um, the question whether, uh, whether or not, and, and, and I'm, regulation is sufficient in this. I, th I think what, what, what Tobias, uh, Toms and, and uh, Seattle also said, it's also for, for the, the sector to adapt and to, to, to deal with new realities. In, in the refit evaluation where we look, at, look backwards at the directive, but in the world of today, whether the, the rules that we have put in place a number of years ago are still valid, we have to look at yeah, what, what are the realities that we see now um, and, and do and project how this will, will develop in the future and, and to have a sustainable audiovisual market in, in the EU. And yeah, that, that will be certainly part of a reflection. Maybe I shouldn't have, have, uh, have said at the beginning uh, that the word level playing field is, is, is a, yeah, a word that I can't hear anymore, but it's simply because it's it's, in, it's there, it's the core of the discussion, of course, whether there's a level playing field. And uh, um, yeah, I, I wish there was another word for it, or, or at least a number of words that, I, that we could uh, diversify. Um, I, I agree, we've got, of course, we've got to, to uh, bring also this aspect. If, if we will have a future-orientated regulation of audiovisual content, what we are talking here about, then of course it has to fit reality, and reality means we have a globalized world. So, um, and then I'm quite, I'm quite optimistic that it works. Why not? So from my point of view, normally also companies sitting in Silicon Valley are interested in fitting a law if there is one. But at the moment, if there is no, why they should? So uh, let's take the example because yesterday uh, Mr. Schreier from Deutsche Telekom answered for this point of findability and access that this is so complicated in a new world. I don't know if this is complicated, but we can first decide if there is a political will to have something and then we can ask companies to fulfill this will. I think um, that leads a little bit to the philosophical question if right follows reality or reality follows right. And as I am European and German, I have a strong belief in right. Um, just going back to a point that Marcel brought up with regards to the reality of today. Yes, we are, we're, we're very much on the online world. It's no longer a bordered uh, area that we, or space that we can talk about. We're talking within a global marketplace. But with that comes empowerment, comes empowerment of the creators, especially the European creators, but also empowerment of the European consumer. And I think that that's uh, just to, to mention those points because 
Obviously, the reality of today is slightly disruptive. It's slightly disruptive to the reality that we knew five years ago, the reality that we probably knew two years ago, and will continue to be that way with, with, the, with the innovations that come on board. However, uh, we also need to try and grab uh, the opportunities that that brings with it, and I, that's why empowerment to me lies really within the center of this discussion and how we can actually use that to the benefit of Europe as a whole, be it the creators or the, or the consumers. Well, uh, just to add to that, I, I would pretty much agree to what was said, and uh, just to add this, uh, my point is that uh, there are sort of no, the border lines between different kinds of, of uh, media are disappearing even more. I mean, this particular conference, I understand, is aired through the internet. So this is this media, I mean. Have the organized organizers considered the sort of uh, regulatory requirements when they, they, they decided to put the cameras on and air this event? I think uh, they fit with the requirements, definitely, but the, the question is, what was the mindset when they, did they understand that they are entering into the media? I mean, was, was this uh, was airing this event, event? And I think there are many, many examples and instances where sort of doing the activity, uh, it is difficult to say whether this is uh, activity related to audiovisual services or not. So it's expanding, I mean, with every day and with every next move. I have one last question for. Yeah, thank you. My name is Alexander Kleist. I'm from Unity Media, KVW, um, the German branch of Liberty Global as a cable operator. Um, I have some remarks, especially at what you mentioned to be as before. Um, you were talking about uh, objective-driven regulation and especially of the idea of opting in to a specific part of regulation for uh, broadcasters that are offering um, social political high value content. Um, yeah, I think when I heard this for the first time, it really sounds good to me, but um, especially when we are talking about things like uh, less regulation in, in advertising rules and like that. But um, I think, uh, as already you mentioned, Alexander Scheuer mentioned it as well from Deutsche Telekom, I think it's getting more complicated when we are talking about access and findability. So on the first point, I think, um, what, what shall we do when there are at one point like maybe 100 um, broadcasters or other companies that are saying, okay, we are offering now high value content. Um, when we're looking at linear TV, it just, I think it doesn't work when we, when we are talking about um, special access regulation then. Also, it would be on the coast of a third party, so in, in my opinion, um, when we are regulating on coast of a third party, we should at least uh, find some way on compensation, whether it comes from the broadcasters or whether it comes from uh, tax money or whatever. <coughs> and when we are looking at a nonlinear world, um, findability, like imagine the, the screen with all the apps on it. Do we have, like uh, also Alexander Scheuer mentioned that example, do we have uh, 10 pages of um, a social political high value content and then after that um, we can find like the, the broadcaster that offers us movies and, and things like that. I think when we're talking about regulation we should mostly focus on the user interest and <clears throat> I think it's important that the user can find the content that he wants to find, um, that it, he can find it in a non-discriminating way but um, we shouldn't put like all the, the um, other so-called high-value content on all the first pages and the user maybe wants to see something else. Thank you. So um, Marcel asked me to be short. <laughs> Nevertheless, I think there are um, two uh, important points. First, to, uh, to put a misunderstanding away, we have never asked for a special regulation. It's not our idea that broadcasting has to fulfill obligations. I only said as long as society would ask to do so, there is, there was, like Mascari, and there is in future the need to have two sides of a medal because to generate special kinds of content is driven by the idea that population gets this content delivered. So that 
means we've got to produce, you've got to distribute. That's the game. If we don't have any more this need, I'm fine, then not. But if, then we've got to see it on both sides. Second, it is not complicated, but uh, um, that would uh, cost too much time. I can uh, only uh, tell you in, in, uh, the result of a short conversation I had with a regulator, an European regulator, um, on an big island, more in the north, and um, and I asked, uh, how, how, what are your thoughts? How you could solve this issue of uh, having 500 apps on one page only for public value? And he said, that's not my duty. I'm only here to take care if the principle of access and findability is done. And it's up to you, the cable network provider, the application, in the application industry, the, um, and the, the companies like Samsung to suggest something. No one has said that you need to make 150 apps for public value content on the first 500 pages. You also can say there is one button when you press it, you come to public value, or I don't know what, because I'm not working in this kind of industry. So I'm very, very optimistic that, um, that this um, very innovative industry will find solutions and ideas to fit the interests of society and the consumer. Okay. I would like to, to thank the panelists for, for a very interesting discussion. Um, I should mention that, that those of you who are who are not Latvian speakers and don't have a hat set, hat set to get one now because the, 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 the final speech by, uh, by Einar Demans will be in Latvian. Um, um, yeah, so, so indeed, thank, thank you panelists and uh, I would like to invite uh, Lorena and Einar Dinas uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, for the closing and summing up speeches. Thank you.